very happy to be here and talk to the Y Space community as well as people who are connected to Ella. I had a great uh, experience being part of Ella, especially since my time with them started during COVID. And it really was nice to have a community of people where we were all in similar stages in terms of launching our business. Uh, to be all together to sort of think about how we how we navigate the beginning of COVID. And then I was extremely pleased when um, Ella came back and asked if I would uh, support them in this capacity and other capacities in terms of being a legal consultant uh, or legal, legal information consultant. I'll put it that way. Um, I can't get my Olight to work. It's draining the power from my laptop for some reason. So um, my lighting is not as ideal as I would like it to be. But anyway, Thank you very much. I expect that I'll take you through my presentation in about uh, 60 to 90 minutes. It depends on if Serena wants us to answer questions as we go along, or if we want to do questions at the end, that's really up to you. Um, in terms of my background, I've been a lawyer in the province of Ontario for 20 years, 22 years. I can't, ever, I can't ever remember if 22 was starting or 22 was finished, if you know what I mean. Um, my background is I've always been in business, a business lawyer. So I started off as a Bay Street lawyer for the first few years, and then I went in-house. So the vast majority of my working experience has been working inside of businesses, either providing legal services or commercial or ethics and compliance. And in the last uh, two and a half years, I decided to launch my own firm. And I only work with business clients. Um, and most typically the kind of work I do is I work with companies who don't have their own lawyer or who have their own legal department, but those lawyers might be short staffed. And then I usually or almost always work directly with the business teams in order to help them negotiate and put their and draft and write their contracts. Um, new contracts usually, but oftentimes as well, it might be um, claims negotiations or helping them work through um, potential client or, or um, supplier disputes. So what, what we're gonna do today is I'm going to take you through some of the basics of legal information that I think that you should have as entrepreneurs. Some of you might already know some of these things. Some of you might already know a lot of these things. So I hope that we can make this interesting for everybody. And I'm gonna start off by sharing my screen. This presentation will be made available to you. Okay. And I really want to start off by saying everything here is a high level overview. It's not meant to give you advice on any particular legal situation or business situation that you are in. If you need specific information, then you should always reach out to somebody who can help you on your specific situation. So consider this to be legal information only. And to start the presentation right now, you will often have lawyers say this to you and you're gonna wonder why. And that is because um, under the rules of professional, under our rules of professional obligation and under our insurance rules as lawyers in Ontario, we can only provide legal advice to our clients because that's the only work that we are covered where our insurance covers us. So this is why you'll never have someone who's not your lawyer give you legal advice because our insurance does not cover those situations. Uh, in terms of our agenda today, um, I wanna talk about uh, four basic things. Um, one is something near and dear to my heart and that is leadership and ethics. Um, secondly, I want to talk more nuts and bolts, and that is the corporate side of your business, so setting up your business structure. Thirdly, we'll talk about the commercial side of your business, which is running your business. So these would be your commercial agreements with your suppliers or your customers or others. And then finally, I wanted to give you some of my 
tips on working with professionals such as lawyers, accountants, or others who might fit into those categories. And then if, um, if you don't mind, we can save questions until the end. Although if you wish to ask in between, that's fine with me as well. Okay, so why leadership um, and ethics? Um, so that's sort of my first box there. As the owner or creator of your business, you really are setting the culture. You're setting the tone from the top of your organization. Whether you are a very experienced entrepreneur or whether you are a student, somebody who's just starting out, you are setting the tone. And it is much easier to set up a business with the right views of ethics and integrity than to try to fix it later especially if along the way you've created bad practices or if you have made bad hires or if you've allowed a toxic workplace to, uh, to grow. Uh, there's many, many reasons why you want to start with ethics. Um, it could be because one day you have plans on being a publicly listed company and they all have a lot of requirements in terms of having codes of ethics in place. Um, you might wish to be, you know, start a business, grow a business, you know, be a unicorn and have it bought out by a, um, a more mature business. Well, as they do due diligence on you, one of the things that they may look at is your organizational culture. Um, you want to retain, you want to find and retain good talent. Um, you want to minimize um, potential claims made against you, like employment claims. So there's many reasons why you want to build in strong leadership and ethics. Um, mainly, you know, in addition to doing the right thing, and that to me is enough of a reason to do the right thing, is you also want to um, create a successful culture and you want to protect your company and yourself from reputational risk. Um, that comes along with um, making bad decisions or cutting corners or overlooking certain things. And certainly in my experience, because I've been working in the area of ethics and compliance for uh, many years now, um, this is something that big companies should pay attention to, but it's also something that startups should pay attention to. And sometimes startups think that this stuff doesn't matter when actually it does matter. And I would, I would expand this into making sure that you are considering ethics, even in the design of your products and how you provide your products. So it's, it's not just something to think about in terms of how you deal with your employees or how you deal with your uh, business relationships, but also how you plan on dealing with the actual product that you create, um, which I'm sure, whether it's a product or a service, your goal is to help other people so let's make sure that when you're even designing your services and your product, you are thinking about um, ethics in design as well. Um, okay, so getting now into the nuts and bolts. Um, many of you might have similar questions. So some of you might be asking, well, when do I incorporate my company? Or you might be in a partnership or plan to be in a partnership where there's more than one person and you are trying to determine what would be a good structure. Or you might be an individual person who has decided or does not know if they should incorporate at all. And so what we're gonna talk about here are just some basic terms to help you communicate with your advisors or help you to understand what you might be reading when you go out onto the internet if you're trying to educate yourself about these areas, okay? So basically we see three business structures when it comes to businesses, especially small businesses. One is sole proprietorship. That means one owner. Two, it's a partnership, so that's where there's two or more owners. And then three is incorporation. And this is where a company is created, a company is born, and that now has its own legal personhood. It's its own legal entity. So each of these three business structures has its own risks and liabilities, benefits. You must um, make an analysis to determine what's the right one for you. 
Um, your lawyer is going to have certain points of view on which one is better for your situation. Your accountant as well might have views on which is the best for you. And you'll have to digest and, you know, accept, you know, take, take the input they both give you and then make the decision that's best for you. You certainly can start as one and change later. Uh, that, that, that's an option as well. So what is a sole proprietorship? Okay, this is when you, there is no se separate legal entity from the person. So I'll use, I'll use myself as an example. Um, the first few months when I was um, working for myself, so back in 2019, um, I was doing the work as myself, Amy Sandu. My invoices came from Amy Sandu. Any money that I received went into my you know, personal bank account. Um, my now personal assets could be at risk, uh, which is different when you are incorporated. I should put a little asterisk there to say that is different if you're a professional. So we're talking about um, a regular business. And if you, if you are incorporating a professional corporation, um, you know, if you're a lawyer, or if you're a doctor, things like that, um, the personal assets remain at risk. But that's a different, that's a different topic for a different day. Um, Staying with the topic of sole proprietorship, there's a tax impact as well, because any earnings that I made during my time as a sole proprietor are just part of my personal income. And so, so some people, if they, as they're making their decision to go from a sole proprietorship to incorporating their business, some of the things that they think about is, are their personal assets better protected if they create a corporation or is their tax situation going to be better or worse? Um, there, there's more than one uh, factor to look at. If you're a sole proprietor, there's no cost. There's very little paperwork associated with this in terms of you don't have to incorporate, you don't have to do separate taxes. So it's attractive for people um, sometimes, if, especially when they're starting out, but you should be aware that your personal assets could be at risk. Uh, second type of uh, uh, business structure we see is a partnership. And again, there's no separate legal entity. And that is the same situation as if you are a sole proprietor. It's a partnership is made up of two or more people. In a partnership, each of the people is personally liable. So each of the individual's personal assets are at risk. Um, if you are entering into a partnership, ensure that you have a partnership agreement uh, in writing between the two of you, or if there's more of you than more of you. So you know what to do when one person wants to exit the partnership or if there is a dispute. Um, in a partnership itself, there's a sharing of losses and profits. Um, if you're interested, a corporation itself can be part of a profit. Um, and something to really be aware of is when you're in a partnership, your partnership starts once you start engaging in business. So there's no expectation that you have to have turned a profit before, um, before you are sharing in, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the profits and losses of the business. Or sorry, there's no requirement for there to be, a, for there to be profit in your business before you could be considered a partnership. And then the last um, entity, the last uh, legal business structure is a corporation. So this is a separate legal entity. And so using myself as an example, again, in the later half of 2019, I decided to incorporate my business. So Lex Integra, um, the proper name is Lex Integra Professional Corporation, because if it is a professional corporation, the name must say that it is. Uh, I created that a few months after I started my business, and I decided that I did not want to be a sole proprietor, but I wanted to be a corporation. I had um, different reasons for wishing to do so, but um, what is relevant to you uh, for, our, for our discussion today is that Lex Integra is a separate legal entity from Amy Sandu. Uh, Lex Integra has its own GST number, uh, it has to file its own taxes, it has to do annual statements. Um, its tax rate could be different from my own personal tax rate. 
Um, directors of, my, of the corporation have personal liability. So that's something else for you to be aware of. Anytime you are a director of a corporation, you do have personal liability. If you want to learn more about that, you can read uh, the director sections of the Ontario Business Corporations Act um, or the equivalent act in your province or the federal one. Um, you might want to consider getting directors and officers liability insurance. Um, Generally speaking, the idea is the higher the risk, the higher the risk that the business is in, uh, the, it's the best to incorporate sooner rather than later to reduce personal liability. Um, if you incorporate, it is generally, you know, the, the, you have upfront costs in terms of the incorporation cost money. Um, I see a lot of corporations that where the people incorporate, which is the inexpensive part but then they don't get their organizing resolutions done. They don't issue the shares. They don't get the director's consent. Uh, they don't put in place all the appropriate resolutions. That's usually where the cost is higher. Uh, in my experience though, I don't find that people don't do that because they don't wanna spend the money. I find they don't do it because they don't know that they're supposed to do it. Um, so just to summarize then, so what we just did, we took a quick look at, oops, I'm going in the wrong direction, sorry. So we took a quick look at the three different ways, the three most common ways to organize your business or the business structures. One is being a sole proprietor, two is being in a partnership, and three is incorporating the business, which means to create a separate legal entity. And there is no one right answer for what you should do. Um, it might be interesting to see what other businesses have done, but that doesn't necessarily tell you if it's the best, uh, best thing for you to do. In my own work um, as a solo lawyer, I've seen lots of people who have incorporated and lots of people who have not incorporated and people bring different um, points of view, different tax analysis, different risk analysis uh, to bear when they are making their decision. Um, a few um, additional points on the topic of, of, get, of, of incorporating a company, uh, typically, uh, lawyers and accountants can do the incorporation. Uh, more and more, we are seeing um, do-it-yourself online services or um, companies um, where they'll incorporate for you at a lower cost. I, I have not used those, so I cannot tell you um, if I recommend them or not. I just haven't used them. Um, when you are getting a third party, like a lawyer or an accountant, to do your incorporation, you have the incorporation fee that the government charges, as well as the cost of whatever cost the lawyer or the accountant or other third party charges. Um, it's very smart to consider a shareholders agreement if there is more than one shareholder of your corporation. Uh, and really, you know, in my view, most agreements are there to protect you for when things go wrong. So for example, imagine if two of you um, enter into a business together and you both are 50-50 shareholders, but one of you is an investor and one of you is um, there running the business day to day. So do you want to set any parameters around, um, are your votes equal? Do you get to, um, you know, will you both get dividends or will only the investor or shareholder get dividends? These are the kinds of things that you can think about um, as you're issuing shares or putting together your shareholders agreement. Um, a big question that often comes up is, well, what if you and two of your friends start a business and one of you dies? What happens to the shares? Do they go to the spouse or the family of the shareholder who's passed away? Or do the shares somehow get redistributed among the remaining shareholders with the estate or the family of the other person getting them, getting the, uh, the appropriate compensation for the value of the shares? So not, not necessarily um, the kinds of things you might think about on day one. Uh, another 
scenario you could see is what if there's four of you who are shareholders, 25% each, and your company you know, is worth a lot of money, and then one or two of you, let's say all four of you are married, and one or two of you get divorced. And now can the divorcing spouse make a claim on any of the shares, the value of the shares in, the, uh, in their divorce? Um, and if there were some situations where they get the shares, well, now do you want them to be a shareholder in your business? Is that going to be good for the management or the um, shareholder relationships if one of the people now is a divorced member uh, or, or, or a divorced spouse? So I'm not saying that these are necessarily issues that come up on day one. They're just a couple of, 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 of potential scenarios you could have. Um, another one that I have, I've seen is what if you have a shareholder you have two shareholders and they each have a senior role in the company and you know one's a CEO and one or let's say one's a president and one's a senior vice president what happens if for whatever reason one of them sells their shares can they keep their role as president or vice president or if they sell their shares does there have to be some sort of a, a consequence in terms of their employment or vice versa? Um, and then another big topic that is often covered by shareholders agreements is if what if one of you wants to sell your shares? Can you sell it, the shares to anybody? Or do you have to offer them to the other shareholder first? Or what if one of you gets a really sweet deal and like Google wants to come in and buy half, your, you know, buy your shares can the other shareholder say, wait, you have to buy my shares too? So I've, I've, I'm oversimplifying these scenarios on purpose. Uh, and that is, I bet you haven't thought about these scenarios a lot. I bet you're just too busy creating your business or thinking about your business. You know, you're probably not thinking about what if the business runs into problems later. Um, but that really is when these kinds of agreements can protect you or when unfortunately you might wish you had these things in place is when you run into problems like that, okay? Um, I have some, I have written a couple of blogs on some of these topics. So maybe what I'll do is I'll send them to Serena and she can, and she can share them with you uh, and then we can, we can move on. I've already talked about some of these topics with respect to shares and shareholders. Um, some of these items would be for the shareholders agreement and not everyone does a shareholders agreement at day one. Sometimes people will do them uh, you know, much later. But when you incorporate, when you incorporate, which is when you file the articles of incorporation, which let's, it's like the birth certificate of your corporation. One of the questions a standardized form asks you is about the shares. So a lot of people just start off the company and they say there's 100 common shares or there's an unlimited number of common shares. If you wanna go back and make changes to that, you can. You can make changes to some of the parts of the articles of incorporation later. But because it has the status of like a birth certificate, like it's a constating document of the corporation, you would have to file another one uh, that's called articles of amendment. And so these would all be filed with, with the appropriate ministry. And so you do wanna give some thought when you incorporate to some of these questions so that you're not unnecessarily going back later to refile or to, re, to do articles of, of amendment. Of course you can, that is, that is an option, but just something to, to think about, you know, some people will incorporate in the most simple way possible and go back later. And let's say, go back later and say, well, actually I wanna have three or four classes of shares. Um, and they might get input from their accountant at that point to decide how the share structure should look. And then they do new articles uh, of amendment. And that is totally fine. Other people, especially people who might have a bit more experience or are working with a lawyer or accountant who has more experience might at the, at the beginning decide, okay, we're gonna have two, three or four classes of shares and these are the rights 
of the shares and put those into the articles of incorporation. Okay, I'm gonna move on, I'm gonna move on from here. Other things to consider as you are setting up your business or as you are running your business are, do you, do you know what all the requirements are for the kind of business that you have in the location, like in the jurisdiction that you are in? So this could be, if you're in Ontario, certain rules could apply to businesses that are incorporated under the Ontario Business Corporations Act, or it could have to do with the municipality that you're in, you know, something like a liquor license or, or something else might require you to get either a provincial or a city license. Um, that's not a big part of my practice. So that's why I don't know the specifics of it. But just something to think about is do you, in, a, in addition to having incorporated your business or having your partnership agreement, is there anything that's required by law or regulation that for your business where you need to get certain approvals or permits in place beforehand? And once you have them, do you have any obligations for yearly renewals and that kind of thing? Um, business name registration is another one. Are you planning on operating your business by a name that is different from the incorporated company? Or if you're not incorporated and you're a sole proprietor or partner, partnership, um, are you planning on having like a business name that your business will be known by? And have you looked into registering it? Um, another item to consider as you are, as we are looking at setting up your business is your HR structure. Now, do you plan on having people work for you? Are you going to be hiring any employees or instead are you going to be having independent contractors work for you? Um, if they are independent contractors and not employees, do you know what your agreement with them needs to cover in order for the law to agree with you that they are in fact independent contractors and not, not employees, because there are different obligations you as an employer have, then you have when you're in a contracted contractual agreement or relationship with an independent contractor. Um, for those people working for you or with you, whether they are employees or not, have you thought about any non-disclosure or confidentiality provisions that you need to have in place and, and have them sign off on? Um, is there a possibility that they, they could be doing some design work while they work for you? And if so, who owns that design work? Do you own it or do they own it? Um, do you have appropriate health and safety policies in place that are appropriate for the physical location that the work is being done, but also for your industry? Um, others, you know, there's always many, many more topics we can talk about here if we had more time. So for example, um, do you have appropriate privacy policies and privacy practices in place to protect um, the private information of these people? So you, you may or you may not have their social insurance numbers, their birth dates. Um, you might have information about their health, um, depending on certain situations. And so do you know what your obligations are to protect that information and have systems in place that protect that information? Okay, before, before we go to the second half, which is running your business, um, did we wanna ask any questions here, um, Serena, or even if, you know, if any of the attendees or even if Joshua or Marlena have any uh, questions or I'm sure, they must have seen some common questions or issues come up um, when they've been working with entrepreneurs. Anything that you'd like to mention here? Um, so right now, I don't see any questions from the audience. Um, and you have mentioned the uh, business permits. Um, I would like to um, just mention here that um, I personally use BizPal a lot. So to just to search like what kind of permits you need to acquire from the government. Uh, I can share the link here. And I see one question from our audience. Uh, she raised her hand. Feel free to unmute yourself. 
Hi, good evening. Um, I just had a quick question about um, the sole proprietorship and the incorporation. So if you were to start your business as a sole proprietorship, would you then later on down the line, if you decide to incorporate, is that something that you're still able to do? Uh, yes, you, you would still be able to do that. Now, now it might change. Um, it, it might not necessarily be the case that the old business runs into the new business. Um, so, for example, from a tax point of view, I mean, I'm not a tax person, so you'd have to talk to your tax, uh, your tax uh, experts. But once you incorporate, the incorporation would be looking at the income made or, or all the financial information from the time of incorporation, as opposed to looking at the sole proprietorship, which would be taxed under, which would be taxed as part of your personal income. So you can always incorporate later. Uh, there's no problem at all with that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, some of the steps or business businesses business steps that you took before incorporation follows into the new structure. But lots lots of people do that. And I have one question from the chat um, here. What is that rule? Uh, what is the rule that if your business does not earn more than 30K annually, uh, you do not have to pay taxes? Okay, so that's that's a tax question. Um, I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not gonna comment on taxes, it's not my area, but I'm wondering if you are talking about GST registration and the fact that if you earn 30,000 or less than 30,000 per quarter, your GST or your HST obligations are different than if you earn more than that. So anytime I see the $30,000 number, I suggest to people that you might be talking about HST and HST registration. Another question, um, if you're a director of your own solo corporation, what does the personal liability mean? Um, so directors of corporations have obligations under the law, uh, whether or not you are the director of your own company. Um, let's leave that aside for the moment. But if you look, if your business is incorporated under the Ontario Business Corporations Act, you can go and look up the Ontario Business Corporations Act and type in director in, um, in the search function. And you'll see all of the sections of the Ontario Business Corporations Act that set out obligations of you as a director. So from a liability point of view, you'd have to look at what are the things that you are required to do as a director. So for example, if your corporation does not pay taxes, where's the liability going to sit? So does a director have any risk there? So that's, that's a potential question. Um, you also have to look at who are the people. Like if, you're, if, your corporation, if your corporation is a solo made up of one person, right? You're the sole shareholder, you're the sole director, the sole officer, you do everything. Are you gonna sue yourself? Probably not. But what if your company is dumping batteries or without meaning to, without does not realize it's causing some kind of contamination. So what about, so does this, so the stat, you're, if you're a director of that corporation, could you bear liability for that? I, I, I would say potentially, now that's just a theoretical scenario, but the directors are the ones who bear the liability for the corporation's actions, generally speaking. Another question. Um, what is the approximate cost of getting an NDA contract, uh, product service contract built? Um, it all depends on what, what people are charging. But quite honestly, to me, when I see some of these low cost service providers, my question is always how much time are they spending understanding your business and what you need a contract for. Um, I've, that's always my question. So if someone is giving you a price for this or for a contract, ask them 
how much time are they going to spend talking to you to understand your business? How much time are they going to spend explaining the contract to you? And will they allow, will they make revisions to the contract if you're, if it's not adequate for you? So I've seen examples of small business owners who pay a lawyer to get a contract, but they don't understand what the contract says. And so later on, if they run into a problem, they don't, they don't know what protections they have under the contract because nobody explained to them what the contract says. So obviously you're price sensitive and you can't pay a lot for a lot of things. I understand that. But you need to make sure that the contract template or the NDA template that you are buying actually protects you and your business. And secondly, that you understand what it says. Um, in terms of giving a price, um, th that's very difficult for me to say. I, if I gave you a number, I'd be guessing and I'd probably be telling you what I would charge. I can't tell you what other people would charge. But when I, when I charge, I'm building in time to understand my client's business and take them through the contract and explain the contract to them and make revisions if the template doesn't fit their business. And when I see some of the lower prices out there, I don't know how much time those people are spending understanding the client's business or explaining the contract to the client or making changes to the, to the contract. Another question from Sasha, a question about um, register the name. If you register your name in one province, is it valid in other province as well? Uh, it all depends, it all, it really depends. So if you, are you incorporating a federal corporation or are you incorporating a provincial corporation? And so it's, it's, not, it's not as straightforward as that because a lot of it depends on if you have incorporated federally or provincially to begin with. Because if you incorporate federally, you have some different options when it comes to registering the name. Another question from Ken, after documenting articles of incorporation and the classes of share, how do you establish the number of shares, price per shares, and distribute shares to shareholders? So those, those are all what I would consider to be business decisions and accounting decisions. So those, generally speaking, don't waste your money asking a lawyer those questions. Um, another question, can business insurance specific to your industry as a sole proprietor reduce the risk of having someone go after your personal assets? Well, I, I think uh, that I, I don't know. You really would have to think about the different kinds of scenarios. Like what kind of risk are you talking about? Right? Are you talking about having somebody get injured in your factory and, and you didn't have enough insurance to cover their injury and they're coming after you? Or are you talking about another, another kind of risk? Uh, I think my, ge my general view is if you are worried about that kind of risk, then you need to do a cost, uh, you know, you need to do an analysis, a cost analysis to see um, where, where, your, where your risk lies. So lots of people, for example, decide to self-insure. They decide, well, I'm not gonna pay the premiums. I'm just gonna self-insure. And I think you have to look at how risky your business is. So is the risk that you're building, you're making it a flammable product and it runs the risk, you know, there's like a, a, a small likelihood that this could combust? Or are you worried that um, somebody might slip and fall when they are in your premises? Or are you primarily an online business? And are you worried about some kind of like cybersecurity problem? Um, there's really too many, there's, there's so many variations in the question that I think that the person would need to really 
uh, sit down and assess what risks they're talking about, and then talk to an insurer to see um, what kinds of coverage there is. And then are you worried about liability from the public? Or are you worried about liability from your clients or your suppliers? Because sometimes you are able to cap the liability in your contracts. Although you can't cap the liability for tort. Anyways, there's that's what I'm saying. These questions are so unique that that's why uh, somebody can't give you advice. All they can do is give you information and say, you need to do the cost analysis and the benefit analysis and the risk analysis to see what you're really concerned about for your business. Um, another follow-up uh, question from Brijesh. Do you need employee insurance if hire volunteers? I think we have an insurance related session later on. Yeah, I think I think you should have I think you should have an insurance related yeah, and, and I think also it, it depends on what you mean by insurance, right? Like if you're bringing on volunteers, hopefully you're doing appropriate security checks or appropriate checks on volunteers' backgrounds if, for example, they're going to be dealing with vulnerable populations. So even again with the world of volunteers, what are they going to be doing? Who are they going to be contacting? Are they going to be alone with anybody? Okay. Um, last question, um, can you change your business name after some time after incorporating or if you move locations but have it under the same corporation? If you, if you want to change the name of, your, of the business that you've incorporated, you can file articles of amendment and this you can change the name this way. Um, the old name obviously would be seen on the public records, but you could change the change the name through articles of amendment. If on the other hand, you're talking about a trade name or a business name, um, so meaning that your incorporated name stays the same, but you filed a different, you know, doing business as name or an or business or trade name, then you would go, then you could go back and- Visibility. Uh, oh, I think someone needs to go on mute. Um, and then you could take a look at what the rules say about changing business names. I, I gave a link on a, on a page prior. You could take a look there. That's all the questions in the chat. Okay. Okay. So, so what we've really been talking about up until now has been setting up your business. And the questions you've been asking, I think, are excellent questions to show that you are thinking about the different kinds of risk that your business could be exposed to. Some of these risks are gonna be common across all of your businesses, but obviously some businesses, each business is gonna to have to take a look to see what their own particular risks are. We call these doing a risk assessment. And um, you, you can learn from hearing what others have to say, but you really have to understand the risks in your own business to adequately start to protect yourself. Okay, so the second half, this is my actually my, my favorite half, is about the commercial side of your business. So running your business. Um, unless you don't have customers or you don't have suppliers, um, this, this will apply to everybody. And so some of the things to think about are, do you, you, know, do you have a clear view of who it is that you sell to? You know, what is it that you sell? How are you selling? Um, do you do different selling or providing um, fulfillment of your contracts or your orders depending on who you sell to? And then similarly, on the supplier side, who do you buy from? What do you buy? How are you buying? And do you do things differently depending on who you buy from or what you buy? And really, all of these questions are designed again to get you to think about commercial risk and the contract or what you put in place to record how you and the other party agreed to settle that risk. That, that's essentially what a contract is, is you and the other party agreeing on what the risks are and who's gonna bear those risks. So that's why when I talk to businesses about contracts, I don't start from a contract, I start from what is your business? 
what are the risks, the main risks that you're trying to protect yourself from? And then from there, uh, we, would, we would create the contract. So for all of these questions, really, you wanna, you know, you wanna understand. So for example, who do you sell to? If you are selling to very large established businesses, mature businesses, let's say the Walmarts of the world, and you are a supplier to them, right? Uh, your risk might be around getting kicked off the, the supply chain list or um, payment terms taking a very long time, like, like taking a long time to get paid or you know what happens if you don't meet their quality or their volume requirements, right? It's unlikely your problems are going to be based around them disappearing overnight, right? So depending on who you're selling to and what you're selling, your view of the risks in the contract are going to be different. And the, the things that you push back on in the contract are gonna be different. If you're dealing with a really big established business, it's a pretty good chance they have the form of contract already that they want you to sign. The pretty good chance that they have some flexibility, but they don't really want to tell you they have flexibility. They just are hoping you'll sign the contract that they put in front of you. Flip side is if you're the bigger business or you're the more established business and you're looking to enter into a contract with somebody, they might not have a contract and, and are hoping that you will have it or expecting that you will have it. So do you have these things in place? You know, um, I've had, um, I've had small businesses contact me where, oh, I've got a, you know, I'm a service provider in Canada. I've got a big client in the US. They're ready to go ahead. If I send them my contract template tonight, they'll sign it. But I have a contract template. So now they're gonna send me theirs and that's gonna be much more one-sided and in their favor because you may or may not be aware of this, but rarely are you gonna find a contract that is so balanced that either the both parties feel like, oh, that was 100% fair. Usually there's a view that whoever wrote the contract might have an advantage that helps their business more. Uh, and if you don't know how to read a contract, are you gonna be able to spot those things? From my point of view, they're not hidden. They're, they're right there, they're in plain English, they're right there. But if you don't have the experience um, or the time to read these contracts, you might miss these things where there's, a, there's something that you could have prevented or made better for you but you didn't realize that you could negotiate the contract. So that's why I don't want you to think of contracts as being something that are hardwired. I want you to really think about who am I selling to or who am I buying from? Which, which of us has a stronger negotiating power? What are the things that I cannot accept and I will not sign the contract and I will not do the deal unless those things are in the contract? So that's really what I want what I want you to think about. Am I saying that you can negotiate every contract, right? If the, if the Walmarts of the world say they're not going to they're not going to make a change to their contract, am I telling you to walk away? I'm not telling you that. What I'm telling you is you should be aware if the contract that you are signing has anything in it that if you knew it was in there, you wouldn't have signed the contract. So I want you to educate yourselves and be in a position where you can read a contract and you can issue spot and you can see what the problem areas might be for you. And then you can have a conversation with the other side and say, look, you know, I'll give, I'll give you one example. I've seen lots of companies that say to uh, small services companies, you must have this much insurance in place as a requirement of signing this contract. But if you haven't read the contract or you don't understand the contract and you sign it, well, what happens if you don't have an insurance in place? So I've seen lots of companies where the small company says, look, I'll put these insurance, I'll buy this insurance that your contract says I have to have, but now I'm gonna increase the price of the contract 
to cover my cost of buying this insurance for you. And the bigger company says, okay, that's fair. But if you didn't read the contract or understand the terms, then you might not see that opportunity there. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Okay, so I covered I covered some of what's already on this slide. Now I'm kind of getting uh, more specifically into if you are dealing with customers, so customers of your business, where your customer is another business. So this would be like the Walmart scenario. And I basically already covered off um, most of these things. Um, what I will say about the items in pink on the screen is, you know, I've seen lots of small companies where, you know, they're dealing with a great big company on the other side where the small company says, look, we need to be paid upfront or we need to be paid when the contract signs, or we want to get paid for a year of services, you know, on day one. And the other company, the big company says, well, no, our standard is to pay you in 90 days after services are provided, right? And so these are the kinds of things where um, you have more room to negotiate than you might expect, but you need to be clear about what it is that your business needs. And when you're dealing with the other side, sometimes it actually makes sense to tell them, look, I can't, you know, we can't agree unless you pay us upfront. This is a requirement that we have, or, you know, we're giving you a discounted price based on the fact that you're paying us upfront. If you're not gonna pay us upfront, then the discount, uh, discounted price won't be there anymore. Um, another thing to look for in contracts, and these are just examples, it's not a checklist, is intellectual property. Do you own any intellectual property when you create something that you give to the other company? I'm gonna guess that you wanna own it and that you believe you own it, but make sure that's what the contract you are signing says. Um, and I've already talked, I've already touched on, I've already touched on liability insurance there. Okay. Um, so there, there's many of these scenarios. So these are just some of the scenarios. Now, what if you're dealing with, your business is dealing with the public? So now your customers are not other companies or, or, or bigger companies than you. Now you're dealing with individuals. So maybe you have a retail business or maybe you create products that, you know, you sell them on Etsy and you're dealing with individual people as opposed to dealing with another business that's buying from you. So are there any risks that are different than B2B? So some of the things to think about are, um, do you have appropriate privacy policies and controls in place? So for example, if you're dealing with individuals, are they paying you by credit card? And how are you protecting the credit card information that you have now, right? or if you have their addresses, or if somehow you have their birth dates. Um, if you are dealing with, if you have a business where you're selling online or where people are coming to your business um, and they're looking at your website, you know, do you have terms of use set up for your, for your business? Is your web, does your website have terms of use? Um, are you aware of marketing laws to consumers? Um, when they buy something from you, are they doing one of those click wraps where you, you know, click this button and you accept all of these terms and conditions? Um, you should know that contracts generally interpret are generally interpreted in the favor of the consumer. Um, other things to consider are, um, do you have their consent to email them? So you wanna make sure you're not violating Canada's um, anti-spam legislation that came out two years, three years ago. And the last one I had there was AOTA, uh, which, um, um, oh no, I'm blanking. Accessibility of, of Ontarians Disability Act. I think I might have the name wrong, but this has to do with if you have a business and you have customers coming into your business, are you aware of accessibility laws in place that may apply to your business? So 
even when you are looking at the commercial side of your business in terms of who you're selling to, um, there are different things, different things to think of. And the point, the point of today is not to frighten you, but is to say, are you thinking these things through? And are you making a list of those topics that might be high priority, then medium priority, then low priority, and starting to slowly, uh, well, if they're high risk items, I wouldn't do it slowly, but do you have a plan in place in terms of when you're gonna tackle these things? Um, in terms of suppliers, so you are also going to be buying things from other companies or other individuals. And so a lot of what I've said, what I've said already applies as well to your relationships with suppliers. So for example, if you get someone to build your website, they're your supplier. So do you have terms and conditions with them? Um, if so, are you using theirs or are you using yours? Um, what if you are, what if you're in the food service industry and you're buying some um, food or drink or ingredients from a supplier and they're late? Now this is affecting your production or if you're a restaurant, they're affecting your ability to serve your clientele. Is that covered? Is that covered in your contract with your suppliers? So the difference really, the, so there's not a huge difference. The difference though is that now you are somebody else's customer. That's really, that's really the main difference here. Um, other things to consider from you when you're buying from suppliers um, is how much knowledge do you have about labor practices on the supply side? So if you are buying, if you're a clothing manufacturer or and you're buying, you know, if you're buying cotton, raw cotton, and what if, you know, there's lots of allegations that that's made by slave labor in certain parts of the world. What kind of protections do you have in place or what kinds of assessment are you doing when you buy your uh, uh, the items in your supply chain that they are made or they're being manufactured by companies or individuals who are treating their labor appropriately? That's, that's one example. So you might be looking at that from your supply chain and your customers will probably be asking you questions about that when they buy from you, especially the big companies. So, so now we get more into um, some of the, uh, the actual paperwork. So my general and free advice is read everything before you sign it. Take the time you need. And if you have questions, ask those questions. I'm sure you're all experts in your business, but that doesn't mean you're an expert in every aspect of your business. So take the time. Take the time to read it and take the time to ask questions and take the time to understand before you sign it. And if something doesn't make sense, ask. Um, be clear in terms of your own company. Who has the authority to sign documents and bind your company? Is it just you? If you have a partner, can you and your partner, each of you sign or do both of you need to sign as an example? Um, create, create a checklist. I would say create one or two checklists for yourself and create a list of key commercial items. And which one of those are deal breakers for your business and which one of those, which one is ones are more flexible and then create a checklist of key legal items and make sure you understand them. So almost every contract you come across um, will say something about force majeure. Do you have a good idea of what that is? Is it a concern for you or is it not a concern for you? And if it is a concern for you, what do you require the contracts to say? Same with, with liabilities. You know, when I'm reviewing contracts for my clients, I look to see, is there a cap on liabilities? Because that matters to me that I would want my clients to only sign contracts where the caps on liabilities are, are clear and logical. You know, um, intellectual property. 
is that something where it's clear that intellectual property is written in a way that it protects you? Now, if you're selling, um, I'm trying to think of something that you're selling where you don't you don't care, but IP. My mind's turning blank right now. Let, let's say if you are um, selling fruit, you know, you're a grocery store and you're selling fruits and vegetables, chances are intellectual property is not going to be a big deal, right? Um, but if you are an artist or a graphic designer who's selling things, or if you're a web designer and you're designing websites, it might matter a whole lot to you, right? Let me just, um, in terms of the negotiations of the contract, whether or not you have the template or the draft contract that you're sending to the other side, or they are the ones who are sending it to you, it is always worth it to ask for the changes that you want. It doesn't mean you'll get them, but it's always worth to ask, but it's easier if it's early in the negotiations process. So if you're signed, if you're if you're short on time and you or the other company need that contract signed like tomorrow or the end of this week, it's going to be difficult to get people to agree to change a lot of the contract. But if if it's three or four weeks away or two or three months away and you have lots of time, it's a lot easier for the other side to to go away, think about what you want. Um, if they're a big company or even a small company. They probably have to go internally to a different department to get the approvals to make the changes. And if you, you have more time, then you can kind of sit back and say, you know what, I, I can wait to hear back from your legal department or business department about this change. But if you don't have a lot of time, then they're gonna tell you things like, oh, well, this has to go up the chain. It'll take three weeks or two months. We don't have enough time. Um, a second negotiations point is if you are dealing with someone else's lawyer, that lawyer is not acting for you. No matter how nice they are, no matter what they say, they are not acting for you. So be very clear about that. And related to that, if the other side's lawyer is there and you don't have a lawyer there, um, it is totally appropriate for that lawyer not to be there. If I'm, if I'm with a client and we're negotiating a contract and we go to a meeting or there's a phone call and the other side does not have their lawyer, I will drop off the call unless I have permission from their lawyer that I, I can continue. Or not permission, but it's just not considered that nice. So I, I, generally, I generally don't do it. Um, if for whatever reason the other side's lawyer, like you agree for the other lawyer to stay, um, or even if you are there with your lawyer and they are there with their lawyer, don't negotiate with the other lawyer or with their lawyer. Always negotiate with your business counterpart. Let them have to negotiate with their own lawyer. Your job is to get a deal with the other side, with the other business person. And then you internally can deal with your lawyer and they internally can deal with their lawyer. That's just something that I've over my 20 years of experience, I've just seen it work much more to the benefit of the business people if they take, if they take this approach. Okay, so I, that was my last slide on the commercial side of your business. Um, I'm happy to stop here and take some more questions before we finish off. I don't see any questions so far in the chat. Um, if okay. you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. <clears throat> or maybe we can go on and- uh, Yeah, back. sure. Okay. So that last section on the commercial side of things, um, a lot of that is applicable no matter how big or small you are or how big or small your business is. You would just need to like scale my comments up or down. 
And then finally, um, one thing that I learned and I saw and I heard a lot when I was in ELLA, but also as I've um, participate in forums like the forum like this and talk to other entrepreneurs, one thing that I have seen is that people who are new to business, um, they sometimes forget that it's okay to interview different people before they select a lawyer or an accountant or anybody else. So definitely speak to more than one and see if you're comfortable dealing with that person. You really want to be comfortable with them and be able to ask questions. Because if you're not comfortable and you don't feel comfortable enough to ask questions, then your business or, your, or you yourself could be at greater risk because you didn't get a chance or feel like you can ask those questions you need to ask. If you're afraid, oh, I'm gonna look stupid if I ask this question, then that's not the right person for you, in my view, because the whole point of them helping you is so that you can ask the stupid questions uh, because you're not the expert in what they do and they're not the expert in what you do either. And so they learn from you and you learn from them. Um, if possible, identify good experts or advisors in advance and understand when you're likely to need them. And the reason for that is if you call somebody up in a rush, so if, I've, if someone calls me up in a rush as though I need to, you to review this contract tomorrow, and I don't know who they are, we've not worked together before, like I go through a vetting process of the client before I will work with the client. Um, and so it's not gonna be fast unless we've already established our working um, arrangement then that's no problem. But if it's the first time we're opening a file together, um, it's a bit of a process on my side to get the information that I need for the law society and for me to understand the client and see if it's a, if it's a good fit, that kind of thing. So where possible, identify people in advance who would be a good fit, you know, maybe find out um, um, what the steps would be to enter into an, a, a relationship with them and then see what their availability is like. Also, and very important, make sure you understand the pricing structure. You know, is it, is it, is it an hourly basis? Is it a fixed fee basis? Um, is there, um, do you or they like the idea of having like some kind of upfront monthly retainer, sorry, a retainer where you pay a certain amount each month for a block of time that you can use when you want to? Um, are they requiring that you pay upfront and they put the money in trust? You should understand these things and it's your right to ask these questions. Well, not your right, but you should ask these questions and be comfortable with the answers so that you don't feel like you, um, uh, you bought something or you bought a service without understanding the pricing structure or the payment structure. And ask, do they specialize in clients like you? Do they have experience that's relevant to what you are doing? Um, they don't have to be startup uh, specialists, but do they have some experience with working with people like you? So that actually is, is my deck. Uh, are the comments or, or the things that I thought would be, would be useful for people at your stage, maybe some of what I've talked about is sort of more down the road for you, in which case you have lots of time, perhaps think about these things. Or some of you might already have lots of experience with this if you're serial entrepreneurs. But I'd be happy to uh, hear your feedback or take any questions, or if you want to share uh, examples or stories that you think the other people here could benefit from, I'm very happy to share time for that as well. There's one question in the chat. Um, what coverage would you need if you are using your brand on someone's formula? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, Lolita, would you mind unmute yourself and uh, have a converse conversation, explain your question? Hi, thank you very much for your information. Okay, so I wanted to know if I'm using, like I have someone who can make a formula for me. Um, it's regarding skincare. 
So I don't have the, you know, the science background or whatever, whatever. So this is a lab that knows the science or whatever. So they formulate the formula for me. So I'm just going to put my brand in on it. So I'm wondering what type of insurance would I need for that? Um, well, so I don't do I don't do insurance. So I don't know if what you're referring to is um, business insurance. I mean, you should talk to a business insurance advisor or business insurance provider about that. Um, at a minimum, I think, you know, I, I, the way I look at these things, I always look at worst case scenario. Like what if somebody gets a rash from using it or somebody gets hurt, maybe it burns their skin or something. Mm -hmm. Does your, does your insurance cover that? Right. Does your, okay. do your, um, does your contract with the client cover that? You know, what if somebody's kid ate it or dog mm -hmm. ate it? Is that, does your, does your insurance cover that? Does your contract cover that? Does, I mean, your contracts, your contracts wouldn't necessarily cover injury and things like that. Mm -hmm. But you might want to say something about it in the contract or even put and put a label on the bottle. Yeah, the label would right? be on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it's not, to me, it's not just an insurance question. It's also what does your contract with the purchaser say about it? Mm -hmm. As well as does your insurance cover this? Like what, what are your protections in place? Okay. Yeah. And also uh, for everyone know that if you have any insurance question, we will have a session later on uh, in some sometime in March. Feel free to register those and answer those questions. Um, Francis, you raised your hand. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you so much. I had a question around, um, and I realize now it's probably more related to some of the earlier stuff you were talking about, but when we've had a business that we've sort of been limping along for a little bit, and it's just starting to get going. And contrary, I guess, to what the advice you just gave, we did not set up all those documents uh, initially and early on. But there's been a disproportionate amount of work done already. And we've been advised to perhaps do a reverse vesting arrangement. But I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can capture, to some extent, the work that has been done to date and then reverse vest from here forward, or if that's not done in, in setting this stuff up. Um, so again, I can't, I can't comment on, on anyone's specific situation. And you know, when we're talking about vesting, do you mean with respect to shares that employees have earned or, or might have earned? Yeah. Empl well, employees are founders even. Um, I mean, some of that's a tax question, some of that's an accounting question. And so going back to one of my earlier comments, when you get advice, it's important to understand what perspective that person is giving you advice from. So I, so if you're working with a lawyer and an accountant, you want to make sure that, that they are communicating and that the accountant's advice is being sent to the lawyer who's doing the paper, who's probably doing the paperwork at least on writing vesting agreements and that kind of thing. So I can't, I can't give you comments on your specific situation, but I have seen more than one example of companies where after the fact, they are trying to put in place paperwork to reflect um, shares that should have been issued and weren't or vesting agreements, um, and putting in place director's resolutions and shareholders resolutions um, to basically say, you know, these agreements weren't put in place or they should have been put in place and they weren't. And now we're doing it now. And the effective date of these agreements should be X. And this is signed off by the shareholders and the directors. So I, I would never, personally, I would never recommend backdating anything. I mean, let, let alone like the fraud and accounting problems you could run into. Uh, but there are um, um, certainly director's resolutions and shareholders resolutions that you, you can uh, prepare that reflect the fact that, okay, we didn't write these resolutions at the time when we should have, but we're writing them now in order to make sure everything is organized and cleaned up. But your specific question 
I think, uh, A, I think it's fairly complex uh, for, for a forum like this, but B, um, sounds like you need to talk to your lawyers and your accountants and make sure they're on the same page. That's great. Thank you. No, actually just the idea of even, again, not backdating it, but noting that it actually extends backwards is probably a really great solution for what I was just thinking. Yeah, too. but just, but again, you want it to be done properly, right? I'm not saying that you wouldn't do it properly. I'm just saying that you don't want, like, you don't want the documents backdated, right? Like I, I did something a couple of years ago for a client, nicest people in the world. And they incorporated themselves. They had the paperwork. They did it 20 years ago and they didn't do a single thing after that. So I had to help them prepare 20 years of resolutions. And so I had to work, you know, I, I didn't want to raise their costs. So I just said, look, here's the information I need from your accountant. So I wasn't running up the tab by calling the accountant. And as long as the accountant provided information that I needed, I was able to uh, work with the client to put the documents in place that reflected, you know, um, I guess a step-by-step -step approach that um, that we needed to take. I've had other, I've seen other companies or lawyers who take uh, a similar approach, but maybe, um, you know, like where possible, we'll try to do one set of documents to cover this if possible, but sometimes we'll have to break it down into smaller sets of documents, um, which raises the price because it's more work, but some you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis to try to do it properly. I see one more question uh, in the chat. Um, when you're looking into purchasing an existing company, what type of assessment would, you, would, the, lawyer, would the lawyer do? Should we be consulting with a lawyer? Yes, you should be. Um, if you're buying another business, um, the two ways you buy a business is you do an asset deal. So you buy the things or you do a share deal where you buy the company, like where you buy the shares in the company and that's called a share deal. Um, a share deal tends to be, not always, but it tends to be easier but you're buying the assets and the liabilities of the company. So if you're doing a share deal and you're buying the liabilities, you really want to know what those liabilities are that you're buying. If it's an asset deal only, so you're buying the equipment, you're buying the tables, you're buying the chairs, you're buying the cooler, then you're just buying the things and you're, then you're going to put them under your own corporation, presumably, uh, it's more complex. It's just um, because you're kind of breaking down everything into individual things, but there's frequently less risk when you do it that way because you're not buying the assets and liabilities. You're only buying the assets. Um, in terms of what a lawyer, should you use a lawyer? I would say yes. And in terms of what a lawyer does is a lawyer will help you with due diligence. So I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an example. At the very start of my lawyer career, maybe I was a second or third year lawyer or first or second year lawyer. Um, young lawyers frequently, business lawyers frequently are part of the due diligence team in transactions like what you're describing. And I remember at that time, a family member of mine was looking to buy an apartment building in a different city, and they asked if I could help. And I, I sort of was talking them through, you know, doing due diligence. And so one thing that we noticed as we did the due diligence was that that building had had two or three insurance claims over a short time frame, uh, and there had been like two or three fires. And so the question is, hmm, was that business owner making false claims? Was the business owner not appropriately uh, doing maintenance on the building and this was causing fires? Or was there some kind of a design flaw in the building itself and that's why it kept catching on fire? And in the end, uh, the family member did not go through with the deal. 
So that's one example where it's not that I was an insurance expert or anything like that, but it was that um, process of, well, let's get all the documents and let's read through these documents and see what story they tell us about what we are buying. And so last point here, when you're buying the assets, let's say you're buying a whole list of equipment or you're buying their customer list or something, um, you're, buying, you're buying those things, right? But if you're buying all the shares in a business and you're taking, you're buying that, you're buying that corporation and that corporation's assets and liabilities, if there is an outstanding lawsuit against that corporation that you have now just purchased, you have purchased that lawsuit as well. And that's why it's so important to do the due diligence. And so you can assess, is the price I am paying fair considering that there might be, that there are these problems that I am buying as well. And you might just decide the problems are gonna cost more than the potential profit. So it's not worth it. Awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, oh, one more. So for start startups, how early do you need to start working on a, working with a lawyer. Right now I am in the research planning phase. I assume you need lawyer once you are getting ready to sell your products or buy services. Is that right? I mean, it sounds like you, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't think you need to like, I think before you contact a lawyer, it would be good if you know what your services um, or products are going to be because the risks are gonna be different. And it's better to have a more clear view of your risks because when you talk to a lawyer, your conversation is gonna be this big if, if you can't narrow down what the risks are. I might be selling products, but I might be selling services. I might be selling to people in Canada. Oh, I might be selling to people in the US. You see how the conversation with the lawyer could get very, very big and cover topics that are not necessary for your business if you were to wait a little while longer until you defined your business. So I, I think that um, I think that I think the main thing to think about is what are your risks and when do you need to protect yourself? I my and I'm biased. I personally think that you should be talking to a lawyer um, if you're deciding to incorporate. But also, once you're getting to the point of buying and selling, like, do you have appropriate contract templates in place so you can use your own contracts? Um, it'll save you a lot of time uh, in the long run, in the medium in the medium term as well. Um, but also you want to make sure that you can understand what the contracts you're signing say. But, you know, is the lawyer the first thing you need to spend your money on? Probably not. Joshua, I see you're on mute yourself. Are you having any questions? You're going to give me a heart attack. Maybe not. Um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Someone else, I, who's? Um, go ahead, Balikas. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, thank you so much, Amy. Um, I just wanted to ask, so when it comes to registering um, your business and incorporating, is it like two different things? Like, for example, registering a business like in like with the city of Toronto and getting like a business name and all yes, of that? Yes, they're that different. Too? They're different. Yeah. Because when you when you incorporate, you are creating a new legal entity. Um, but if you are a sole proprietor, right, you're just, I don't know, you're making jam and you're selling it from your home like out of your back door and maybe you're only selling five hundred dollars in jam 
you know, it doesn't make, does it make sense to incorporate? I don't know, like the cost of incorporating is gonna cost you more than that. Do you see a big risk in terms of if somebody comes and says they, you know, they got poisoned and got sick while they were eating your jam? Um, registering your business name is different. So that's, that could be, you know, Balakis's blueberry jam. And that might be like the trade name um, that you want to sell your your brand, sell sell your jam under. It, it's not this. It, no, it's not the same thing. But good, that's a good question. Thank you.